Hey everyone, good to see you. Um, congratulations, Connor, shut the fuck up. Um, good to see you all. I am impressed with all of you being able to attend today. Uh, I looked out of my office window at Arbus One and I just thought, I cannot be fucking bothered to walk over here. It's, but uh, my feet are soaking. I'm not happy. But, well, thanks to all of you for coming here today. This is the final, well, it's not a final lecture of the module, but I think it's the final lecture with substantive content that you can use in assignment one. Next week onwards, I'll do a few lectures which will be applied content. So there'll be stuff about dating apps, protest movements, etc. Um, some of you may be looking at those sort of elements in your project, so obviously those things will be useful for you. But basically this is week six, everything that you need should be done by this week. So there's one important set of theories and ideas which are needed to be covered in order to give you the absolute maximum number of things that you can talk about in your project, or you can utilize in your project and therefore use in the second assignment too. And I'm going to wrap these around two applications in particular, but really it's one that's important these days. When I started doing this module, the important one was YouTube. You, so we're talking about, really, 2018? Yeah. Yeah, mm. okay. So 2018, YouTube was the focus of this social television, basically meant YouTube. And content that you might post as video content on other social networks. Since 2018, in particular due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen the emergence of TikTok to become this absolute behemoth of social television, which is what conceptually framed as social television. I have a problem with social television as a concept, because television belongs to an age which is now long gone, where lots of people sat down at the same time every week to watch the same stuff as one another creating what we know as an audience. Audiences don't exist now. Everyone in this room can sit, open their uh, TikTok app on their phone, sit here for the next hour and not watch the same thing as anyone else in the room. Therefore, the idea of what television represents is not what these services represent. These are highly tailored services towards our own interests and our own needs, so they don't really fit the model of television. And unfortunately, when theorists first began thinking about YouTube in particular, the temptation was, let's apply what's known about audience and television in particular to this new phenomenon. It simply doesn't work. So what I'm going to do today is have a little bit of a reflection on why those things don't work and then try and think about what it is, and this fourth point in particular is most important, what is streaming culture, and how does that streaming culture affect everything that we receive as users of digital media today? So digital media in the wider sense, but social media in particular. And hopefully, we can come to a conclusion on how TikTok and YouTube can be conceptualized, because that will be incredibly useful for those of you who are looking at those applications your project, right? So, why should we give a shit? Well, let's start with YouTube. Start with the oldest, right? YouTube founded in 2005, uh, bought by Google in 2006 for a phenomenal amount of money uh, because they saw the value in it. TikTok, uh, YouTube was losing huge amounts of money uh, when Google took it over, but they noticed that. Um, this thing was going to make them billions. So a billion monthly active users of YouTube as a country would be the third most populated in the world after China and India. So this, thankfully with all the content that is on YouTube, it's not a country because it would be fucked up in the extreme. 80% um, of the views are outside the US. So even though YouTube started as an American company and is owned by an American company, it is a, it is a genuinely global um, platform. 
on average, user spends 40 minutes on YouTube on their mobile device a day. That. So you might think of this and think, well, I don't do that. I don't spend 40 minutes a day on YouTube, that's for sure. But this is an average. So you can extrapolate from that that there are some people who are deep down in YouTube polls all the time. Does anyone have a figure from their phones about how much they use YouTube in a week or a day? And so for those of you who actually use YouTube or feel you are YouTubers or something. Like that. last week. Okay, so about 25 minutes a day. Five hours, 24 minutes. That puts you slightly ahead of the average, then. But not ma but not so much that you're like an incel or anything. That's okay. Uh, day it seems to be exactly 40 minutes. Exactly. There you go. Mr. Average. Yeah. Mr. Down the Road Average. But that's not what I mean. There's no one. Um, <clears throat> any others? Come on. 18 hours. Eight in a week. Yeah. Dude. I have ADHD, really it's just running in the background. Well, I think, and I know you're going to say the same as that, Emma, and I it's, it, it is something which plays in the background. There's probably weeks where I get spike on this, because I've simply forgot to close it in my browser or something like that, and it's kept it on going and going and going, right? And I'm not watching it in any way, shape, or form. We got eight hours in a week. Yeah. Okay, that's, that sounds right. It's less than that. Mm. Yeah, it sounds about range worthy. So, something that consumes half an hour a day, 40 minutes a day, isn't the most significant thing in people's lives, I would argue. But nevertheless, it is something that people are doing, right? Four million um, YouTube videos are viewed every day. Six billion hours worth of uh, videos are watched on YouTube every month if you extrapolate those figures out. That's a lot. There's not six billion hours worth of television content in the history of television. There's not six billion hours worth of movie content in the history of Hollywood. So that's per month, every month, forever, until somebody decides to shut YouTube down, which they're not going to do. 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. That is a scary amount of shit going up on YouTube. Indeed, after this lecture, I will upload two hours worth of content for nobody to watch apart from one really weird guy in America and I am talking to you bitch who wants to pick up the minutia of things which are said and start an argument with me about it even though it's quite clear he hasn't got a fucking clue what he's talking about and I suspect he's an engineer and stupid because um, YouTube reaches now this is where it gets important right YouTube reaches more 18 to 14 year, nine year olds in, uh, than any cable network in the US. Okay, okay, well, what's the context of that? The prime advertising demographic is 18 to 49. Because those are the people who have A, disposable money, and B, are easily influenced by trends. And advertisers have always seen those people in that demographic as being the key people. If you can attract those people to your products, you are winning. Cable networks in the US are funded on advertising revenue. And since 2005, advertising revenue across cable networks in the US, across television in the UK, Europe, indeed the entire world, but this is extrapolated out to newspapers as well, all that advertising revenue has shrunk dramatically to magnitudes of 80-90% of its original value in 2005, not adjusting for inflation, because of services like YouTube, which are sucking up advertising revenue like you wouldn't believe. So if you want a primary reason why local newspapers have all shut down, television stations now produce junk all the time, well they haven't got any money to produce anything else, quite frankly. Why is there, you know, why are there entire channels full of reality TV shows? Well, reality TV is really, really cheap to make because it's not hard to buy 12 retards to go on a reality TV show and stick a camera there. Okay? That is the beauty of Love Island. 
find 15 pitchery retards who will go to a villa somewhere and lounge about in bikinis. Not hard to do, also cheap. Television companies don't have money for big productions anymore because the money has been sucked up by networks like YouTube. And that is why Google bought it in the first place. It wasn't about empowering people to make their own content. If you look at what YouTube had, uh, what Google had to say about YouTube in 2005, that's all they were saying. This is all about empowering people to make their own content, to give people voices when they didn't have a problem. Google didn't give a shit about your voice, okay? All Google cares about is how many of those eyes can it get to sell things to them. And it's done extremely well out of it. So, YouTube matters. It matters as an economic you know, giant in the contemporary world. Now, TikTok, I would love to say it doesn't matter, that it is stupid, and that we should all delete it. There's only two problems with saying that, right? One, I'd have nothing to do. What the hell am I going to do for four hours every day if I delete TikTok? You know, where am I going to watch films? That's where I watch films now, is on TikTok. I cannot sit and watch a film for two hours. I have to watch it in 30-second bite-sized chunks on TikTok all day. That's my life. I have been watching a film this morning instead of writing a chapter for my textbook on TikTok in my office. And I'm going to pay for that. Nah, but it was research for this lecture. What's going on, right? So, what do we have here? We have 23.6 million total video views every hour on TikTok. Uh, $181,250 spent uh, in an hour by global users on TikTok affiliated websites. You know all these things where you can swipe and go to the store to buy stuff? TikTok owns those stores. <laughs> they belong to TikTok. All that shit that's being sold, TikTok owns that shit. And we are spending nearly $200,000 an hour on that shit every hour of the day. Roughly speaking, about $11 million in just selling crap to imbeciles every day. Everything I have bought from TikTok has been shit beyond belief. The uh, nice thing I saw where with the, you know, when you put your washing up on for it to drain, and it's got the little spout that goes into the sink. See this there? I bought one of them. Piece of shit. Lasted about 10 minutes, I threw it out. Um, I didn't actually throw it out, I threw it into my next door neighbor's garden because his garden's a fucking tip and I should be bothered to kill the But it, it's in there. There's nail clippers I bought, crap, they don't collect the nails at all. Um, absolute junk. Um, TikTok generates a stupendous amount <coughs> of cash per hour. That's really interesting to me. In 2023, the app was downloaded 120,000 times an hour. Now that's scary. That's 2.4 million downloads a day. That doesn't mean that people are downloading it for the first time. It could be they're downloading it on a different device, for example. They might have multiple devices. They might have a new phone, so there's a download. So we can't say that's that many new users. But if you're getting like 2 million downloads for that, day. That is a hell of a lot of people using this. So, TikTok is ex <laughs> whoa, incredible. I like some of the influence of things. $463 every hour. Can you imagine getting a job where you're paid $463 an hour? I'm paid like, I, I, I sat down and worked out my pay once and it's not, it's not it's pretty good, right? but it's, it's not that fucking I can show you. Um, you know, what's a good rate for pay at the moment? What, 11? Does that sound about right there? 11 quid an hour sounds like a good amount. What's the national minimum wage? It's like 750 for the orange. 750 for the That's like fucking scandalous. I'm going to vote these bastards out, didn't they? All right, this is disgusting. 7 pound 50? What the fuck? Okay. I got limited sympathy when I was your age, the national minimum wage for people my age was £2.50 an hour. 
<laughs> I had a job at oh. 2.15 an hour. Yeah. I did not bust my ass. I hope I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie to you. Um, I mean, that, the, the scary amounts, right? $463, $579 an hour. If you're earning 500 you could do, you could do the math. You know, $570 an hour, that's what? <laughs> that's a lot of fucking money. Um, that's 12 grand a day. 12,000 quid a day. That's Premier League football level. That's scary stuff for being on TikTok. The question that comes to mind is, why can't I be good at being a TikTok? Who wants to be a TikTok millionaire? Show your hands. Come on. Who wants to be a TikTok millionaire? You fucking liars. <laughs> All of you. you I, oh, it's disgusting. You kiss your relatives with those mouths? That's awful. You do all want to earn those big bucks. Yeah. I want to earn those big bucks. But I'm stuck in this shit up. So, listen. Yeah, the rain on the roof. This this roof's going to come down halfway through this lecture. We're going to have to abandon it. <laughs> um, so, more prosaically, what's that to go? Sorry, uh, you all have this obviously on the slide, so you can pull it up a bit bigger. Um, in terms of advertising, what's important here? This one. 33% of customers respond better when ads refer to them directly on TikTok. What does that mean? Have you ever had an ad on TikTok which has spoke to you directly? No. Um, what it means is ads which are tailored to your interest specifically. So TikTok's algorithms will hoover up more information than anyone else on your interests and tailor things very, very acutely to your interests. That creates an emotive bond between the user and the advertising that is going on on it. And because of that, people feel that TikTok is a nicer environment to be advertised to. What else have we got here? ByteDance is worth... Um, about $400 billion as a company. That's scary. That's a scary amount. Um, TikTok has over a billion monthly users, blah, blah, blah. But this is the big figure. 45% of TikTok users are in the 18 to 24 age groups. So nearly half are in absolute advertising gold. So 18 to 49 is the broad demographic that advertisers look at and think, got to get to those guys. But the 18 to 24 is the absolute gold for advertisers. Why? Why? Because you're stupid. And you'll buy any old shit that's dangled in front of you. But in a more considered <coughs> answer, it's this. 18 to 24-year-olds are much less likely to have, to have two things in their lives. Own a house have children. And when you have those two things, your disposable income goes down to virtually zero because you've got to spend all your fucking money on the house and your kids. 18 to 24 year olds, I know some do have these things, houses less likely these days than children, but they are far less likely to have those two drains on their disposable income. So by even though 18, 18 to 24 year olds earn considerably less than people higher up, their proportion of disposable income compared to other demographics is higher. That's why advertisers see them as gold. Get them while they still can be got. Because once you hit 25 and above, the proportion of people who have that disposable income in that age group gradually shrinks until when you get into the 40s, it's not very many. All. Therefore, a platform that has that proportion of users, you know, we're talking a billion monthly users, and 45% of them are between 18 to 24, TikTok is advertising gold. So, even compared to YouTube, TikTok is swamped with advertising money. What's interesting about that is that the way that that advertising money is spent. TikTok doesn't have a great deal of advertising by companies. Instead, companies have decided to leverage influencers 
in order to reach more appropriately on the platform. So, why are they important to us? Well, platforms designed, or at least with design principles, for the sharing of user-generated content. Therefore, we're into that realm of sharing the self again, with uh, Irving Goffman, which I covered in which week? Three? That's all right. Nobody knows. I'm going to say three. Nobody's going to contradict me. Right. So it's a platform that creates content to be shared across other networks as well. So TikTok and YouTube content is designed to be cross-platform. And platform was used by major corporations, importantly, in the sharing of content. Now, in the importance of YouTube in particular, is a platform owned by Google. And there's a good reason for that, as I've already said. And therefore, it brings Google into this whole discussion of social media as well. What do we know about Google? Well, what we know about Google is, you know, I did a whole, you know, last week I did, like, did anyone get the impression last week that Facebook is a pretty evil company? Yeah, that does sound like a, that's a good takeaway. Yeah, that was a fairly good takeaway. What is important to note is, I don't like Star Wars, right, but you know the principle. Have, you, have everyone in this room seen a Star Wars film, at least, so they know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Alright, so in Star Wars, you have like this evil motherfucker, right? Like the Emperor or something. And he always has like some young evil doer who he's training to be evil in the future, right? That's the relationship between Facebook and Google. <laughs> Facebook is the young evil, alright? Facebook is like the pretender to evil. Because the company that created the evil is actually Google. They're the big daddies of evil, right? <laughs> Facebook is just copying them. So, Google's model of operation is constant, real-time, biopolitical exploitation. There's a lot of words there which need unpacking. Constant. Google is always on. If you have a phone, Google is always tracking you in particular ways. Doesn't matter if you have an iPhone. If you have Chrome installed, for example, Google is doing the same thing with your iPhone. But if you have an Android phone, it is always on doing it. So it's constantly working. And it is constantly working in real time, pulling down data in real time to analyze about you at that point. Biopolitical. Now, there's a picture of a word. It comes from Michel Foucault, who we should all be familiar with, at least a little by now. Um, and biopolitical means the politics of bodies. Okay? So, you know, very simple explanation, I've just pulled it apart, right, and explained it in that way. What does that mean? It means politicizing our human bodies in particular ways. Control being exercised over the body itself. And then obviously exploitation means control to exploit the human in a particular way. So when we put that all together, what is Google's model? They're constantly pulling in data about you to make you do things that they want you to do. Because that is political power. Oh, that's gold. That's why I'm explaining that like that. So, Hardin Negri argued that contemporary capitalism, which Google is a foundational part, is based on what Foucault called biopower, which means power of bodies. So, Google's vision is one where the world is made completely knowable, controllable, and predictable. You might think, that's paranoid nonsense. No, that is in Google's mission statement. That is a quote from it. That's exactly what it says. Make the world knowable, controllable, and predictable. How do you make it knowable? By pulling in as much information about the 8 billion people on the planet as you can all the time, in order to make those people controllable, and once you control them, you can make them predictable. So we know what we're going to do all the time. That is not me making stuff up, that is Google's mission statement. It wants to make you into happy little marionettes that dance to a particular team. Why, you might think, does it want to do that? Because Google literally says that will make the world a safer place. If we know everything about everything that goes on in the world, the world will be safer for us all. That is its vision. 
That is called a solution, a solution to a problem, right? Google sees that the problem of the world is, the reason why the world is shit is that we don't control it. That's, that's bad. That's real bad when you put it like that, right? The reason why the world is terrible is we as a company don't control the world. If we control the world, the world would be great. Hmm, I've got problems already. Now, any company or uh, technology service that takes that approach is applying what we call a technological solutionist approach. Technological solutionism means it's an ideological position that says you can solve all the problems of a particular field by applying enough technology to it. So, for example, in certain fields of medicine, a long time ago now, it's decided the best way to get on top of this is to apply as much technology to it as possible. If you look at, for example, cancer treatment, you apply as much technology to that as possible, it will make cancer easier. That's a technologically solutionist approach. There is no doubt that the application of technology to cancer treatment has improved outcomes for cancer patients over the past 50 years. You cannot argue with that. What the media hasn't done is cure cancer, because that is a beyond the limits of what technology can do at this point in time. With AI, who knows, maybe, but I wouldn't back it. It's, it's a different sort of question. Now, what Google's trying to do with its technologically solutionist approach is take the problem statement that the world is a big problem and say, we're going to throw technology at it to fix it. Hmm, that's not going to work. Right? I could have told them that back in 2003 when they wrote this garbage. No, nope, that won't work. But nevertheless, that's what they're trying to do. So, solutionism basically recasts all complex social situations either as a neatly defined problem or computational, something which can be computed in different Basically, what Google is saying is all social problems can be solved if we know enough about those people involved and we reduce them down to data that we can compute. And if we can do that, then we can fix the problem. Unsurprisingly, Google hasn't fixed any problems. It's made a hell of a lot more. So, it's a typical ideology of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and intellectuals who glorify digital media as being the solution to societal problems instead of realizing that actually it's caused just a whole bunch of new problems as well. So digital media itself, it's fine, it's all right. I, I advocate digital media, I think it's great. But we shouldn't ignore that it's created a lot of problems in society as well as perhaps fixing some of the uh, past. In a discussion with my partner about this the other day, we were walking a dog, right? And, um, I don't know, eight o'clock at night? Um, and it's Friday night. So eight o'clock on Friday night. Now, when she and I were kids, we didn't grow up in the same town as one another, but broadly similar kind of places, right? Um, eight o'clock on a Friday night was like fucking bed night before I grew up. Every kid was out on the street, either setting fire to something, snorting something, or drinking their own body weight and alcohol, right? And that was constant through the nineties. You look around now, 8 o'clock on a Friday night, there's no kids around. And she goes, where's all the kids? I said, what do you mean? And she says, like, well, do you remember when we were kids, like Friday night we'd be out you know, torching cars, or, you know, whatever, you know, or, you know, kidnapping police, whatever, you, whatever the Friday night took you to do, right? You'd be doing something antisocial, right? I said, yeah, well, kids don't do that anymore. She said, well, what do they do? I said, well, they sit in, talking to each other on digital devices, and said, oh my god, that's really depressing. I was like, well, yeah, you're right, in one sense. It could, you could say it's really depressing. You could also say it's safe. You know, if I was like 44 in the 1990s, I probably wouldn't have walked around very much on a Friday night when there was in bedlam going around everywhere. I would have been a little bit like, oh, I'm going to stay out of that. These kids look feral, like, you know. We don't get that anymore. Feral behaviour from young people is, is radically down thanks to digital media. It's kind of solved a societal problem in some ways. It's also created other societal problems by to its solution as well. We now have an epidemic of social anxiety, for example, which is not caused by digital media, but it's a contributing factor to it. If we live atomised lives where our social contact is with other people mediated through a device, when we get into situations when we're around other people, it creates an anxiety in us. 
because we're not socialised to act in that situation. Perfectly understandable. We have a huge amount. So people, people don't get it very much at university. So why? I, I've literally heard this in meetings. Why are these uh, students so socially anxious? It's like, do, do you want to do it on a fucking PowerPoint for you? It's really easy to understand, you know, dumbass. Um, so, okay, problem solved. Now it's safe for boomers to walk around at night. A bigger problem perhaps emerges afterwards, right? This is the problem with technological solutionism in a nutshell. People think that they can solve problems with applying technology. What they usually do is create a whole bunch of problems that they hadn't envisaged. That's called unintended consequences. Most actions have some kind of unintended consequence. For example, yesterday when I was driving home, I tried to run over a pensioner, right? It's a victimless crime as far as I'm concerned. They would be fucking dead in a couple of years anyway. And I wanted to check out whether my windscreen wipers were working properly. So I thought, do you know what? Accelerate towards this pensioner, wipe them out, put the windscreen wipers on before, and if the blood and guts get swept off like that, job done, right? I put them on correctly. I missed the damn pensioner, right? Looked a bit more, didn't look as sprightly as I thought when I was driving, got out of the way. Unfortunately, in doing that, you know, I smashed into a parked car. Unintended consequence. No, no crime has been committed. I didn't mean to do that. Unintended consequence. I'm the victim, if anything. Pensioners are fault here. Yeah? That's what I mean by an unintended consequence. Disclaimer, I didn't do any of those things, all right? But that's what I mean by unintended consequences. So, solutionism basically reimagines individuals and the whole concept of the social, which is important, remember, we are talking about social media as part of the algorithms or systems of digital media, and therefore any problems arising at an individual social level can be solved by those digital media. If you're a technological solutionist, you actually think of human beings as being part of this system. So it makes sense to think if you fix the system, you fix the people, right? The big the big error being made is thinking human beings are part of that system in the first place. They are not. The old, our role in that system is a, a role of what we call abstraction. Media companies abstract data from us to put into these systems. They don't put us into these systems. <laughs> data are constructed. They choose which data to take from us. They don't take everything from us, so it's always a partial picture. But because of this, Google can be seen as a control machine that aims to control people's perception of reality and transform those perceptions into profits. That's what Google's business model is. And because of that, YouTube is incredibly important because that's the platform on which they articulate that vision. It should be of no surprise to anyone, well maybe this is a surprise to someone, can anyone explain to me why TikTok hasn't been bought by a big Western company? Because it came from China. That's a, as good a reason as any I can think of why it should be bought. Oh, that's not true. TikTok has been dangling itself in front of Western media companies for years looking. Because okay, I mean the, the owners of TikTok want to get they're rich already, they want to get super rich. No, I mean, uh, they don't want to be controlled by Western companies. As opposed to the Chinese state? Yes. Okay, <laughs> we'll get into that argument another time. Um, any ideas? Because they've all tried. Because like, Western companies does not have enough no. I mean, it would be at the limits. But I'm sure, like, you know, if Facebook really wanted to, they could find it. It'd be the biggest corporate takeover in history, that's for sure. The reason why I raise it as a question is this. YouTube is critical to that vision for uh, Google, right? If Google owned TikTok, they'd be a hell of a lot longer further down the road doing this. They really would. The way TikTok works, they would be way closer to so it is a, a pertinent question about you know where people are going to head with this because this vision needs absolute control. 
of people's attention, basically. TikTok created a problem when it came along in 2020. I know it became popular in 2019, but when it really blew up in 2020 during the pandemic, it created a problem for companies like Google. They were like, what do we do here? And the, the classic motivation of social media companies when that happens is one of two things, right? You either copy what's been going on or you try to buy the company. And they've tried to do both of them, not very successfully. You know, you've got short form videos now on TikTok, for example, on uh, YouTube, for example. But people don't engage with them in the same way that they do with TikTok. And the same hand, you've got Google. Google put it ripped someone's arm out to buy TikTok. I don't think it, I don't actually think it's possible to buy TikTok anymore. I think it's too valuable, but um, it would have been in the minds. Now, as users of applications like YouTube and TikTok, we are in what we call the prosumer position. That means we are the consumer of, in this instance, digital media television, and we are producers of it at the same time. We produce and consume. Even if you don't create content for a platform yourself, our comments and our likes and our shares mediate the content always. So we are always involved with the meaning of what is going on with that content. That still puts us in a position where we are producers of different kinds of meaning on these platforms. That's from John Fisk's ideas on audiencing from 1989. If you want the reference for that, go back to MS100, it's in the handbook. So, the prosumer position is an interesting one. The prosumer position is rooted in Stuart Hall's work on audience, on that idea of the active audience and encoding, decoding of messages. This is why the prosumer position is a little bit shaky. Now, Hall can tell us something about the nature of watching social TV if we consider that there's still an audience to be watching something. According to Stuart Hall, as an audience, we're challenged to select and understand content in particular ways, right? So, this is the old-fashioned way of doing things, the linear model of communication, where you know, you're the sender, the medium, and the receiver. I'm skipping over this really quickly, because I know I've talked about it. I'm assuming Will's talked about this in MS200 as well. Stuart Hall's model of this, said instead of having those messages we have encoding message decoding and lots of factors shape either side of the message so in terms of something on youtube you have processes and influences of production you have the platform itself and our reading of it and those three readings that paul says preferred reading oppositional reading and negotiated reading now a lot of work when youtube originally came out adopted this model to look at YouTube as an instance of television production, basically, borrowing exactly the same sort of stuff. This is why this is wrong. Okay? Stuart Hall was writing at a time when basically the model of media was encoding over here means media company. Message meant in Hall's case in particular, television. Although he wrote extensively about magazines and newspapers as well, for this pur purposes of this model, television is really what he's talking about. And then the audience is here. So you have no point of contact between audience and production. They are always kept separate from one another. So in that sense, He's not radically removed from the traditional model of media, of media transmission, which is sender, media, and receiver, where receiver and sender are completely apart from one another. My contention would be this. There is no such thing as this model anymore. Because this over here, which is us, we are also doing that. We are not at the end of a process anymore. We're in the middle of everything. The process is not linear because we sit in the middle of it. And here, and you might think, okay, well, how does that work? Like, well, let me put it like this. We'll go back to the way I stressed it at the beginning. If we all sat here for the next hour looking at TikTok, we would not receive the same content. Hall's model works on the fundamental basis that that's how the media works, that you have Production here, 
a transmission medium here and receivers here. So, in Hall's model, logically, if we all sit and watch TikTok, we're all getting the same content as one another because that's how an audience is formed. That's not what happens anymore. We can all look at the same application, but we all get completely different content from one another. Therefore, this entire model is predicated on an idea that this is at the end of a process. My argument would be that we are in the middle of the process now. And our interests and likes and our history as being a viewer of something shapes production and shapes reception all at the same time. So the model has collapsed down from a linear model to a circular model which atomizes around us and us alone. Therefore, the entire word audience doesn't work anymore. Because an audience is supposed to be a shared group of, you know, a group of people who share a common media reception experience. We don't do that. I mean, there might be the odd instance where a lot of people gather to watch the same thing, for example. Like the Queen getting buried. You know, a lot of people watch that. I, I did not watch that because I thought, like, well, that's a bit fucking morbid, isn't it? You know, and she didn't invite me. Um, a lot of people watched uh, Prince Charles getting um, coronated. Well, I, I didn't watch that because the fuck, like, you know, well, we're kings and queens, what are we going to have next? Like fairies and dragons, what the fuck is going on in the 21st century? A lot of people will sit and gather to watch, you know, um, what have we got this summer? We've got the European Championships men's football this summer, right? And if England do really well, a lot of people are going to sit. And like they did in the last one when they got to the final. And millions of people sat and watched that. And again, I didn't watch that because I'm not English and I wouldn't give a fuck, to be quite honest. You know, if it was Wales in the final, I wouldn't have watched it. But Wales, unfortunately, was shit. So, um, you know, it, there are reasons why I don't engage in these communal sort of sessions of misery. But people do. So maybe for those events, this model might well still have some relevance. But by and large, the vast amount, as we saw in those figures earlier, the vast amount of content that we consume does not conform to a model like this anymore. So basically, what we're going to need is a new set of ideas. What we need to understand is, is there anything that we can salvage from this? Now, for Hall, Media was a site of what he called hegemonic contestation, where we could either agree with or disagree with the dominant ideologies being transmitted by media. This comes, of course, from Antonio Gramsci. And we know what hegemony is by now, the exercise of cultural and social leadership by a dominant group. Now, what we could ask, for example, is does YouTube and TikTok challenge or reinforce hegemony? Now, that's interesting. For me, there are millions and millions of diverse voices on a service like TikTok or YouTube. By necessity, that's the nature of the scale of the operation, right? There's always going to be diverse voices there. Does that mean that we see them? No. Nah. If we think about the content on these platforms, we might be encouraged to say, yeah, this is a positive force for challenging the hegemonic order in society, until you consider that the algorithms at play dictate what we see on those platforms. And if the algorithms at play say, ah no, these crazy left-wingers, they don't get no views, we're not going to spread them to anyone, we're instead we're going to spread all this conservative shit all over the place, well, it's not challenging the hegemonic order at that point, it is reinforcing it in a big way. The idea that it could challenge hegemony in some way is completely contingent on how that is algorithmically governed. Well, like, was like shadow banned as well? Like, is there a way to kind of describe that? Um, like, how does somebody get shadow banned? Like, by saying certain words that I'm guessing, what example do they have, they pick up on and they decide not to show that. Yeah, and TikTok in particular is really powerful at this. You know, it, it, it would outwardly, especially in the West, say that it doesn't have a list of prohibited terms. I mean, Facebook says much the same thing about its services as well, about Instagram, Facebook itself. We know that's not true. And we know that, you know, and in particular, I mean, the one, the one company that's all full for shadow badding, which we never talk about, is actually Meta slash Facebook. They will absolutely bury content, which doesn't fit in with their political aims. Um, 
but they will always deny it as well because they're powerful enough to stand there and lie and say we don't do that even though we know that they do um, and if their political aims are the whims of Mark Zuckerberg who one minute thinks <coughs> Trump is amazing next minute thinks Trump isn't amazing but actually is a really Trumpy guy then democracy itself is in real power, in real peril, because we don't get a diversity of political views on that platform, which is used so much. So, you are right then that shadow banning is one of the techniques in which challenges to the hegemonic order are actually really, really um, taken down. We should also question the very notion of watching. Now, I think, you know, I'm doing, I'm listing all these things in the context of what happens actually when I watch television, which I don't do a great deal, I'll be honest. Last night though, I, and on Sunday nights in general, I'll prepare for this lecture, you know, I'll get the slides up and I'll read through and remember what I'm going to say and all that good stuff, right? So this isn't just all off the cuff, this is deeply prepared, down to the second, right? But I'll do it when I'm watching basketball, because I really like watching basketball, it's a good sport and enjoy watching them and watching it for a long, long time. So, when the basketball was on last night, it was Boston Celtics versus the Golden State Warriors. Actually, it was kind of a boring game because Boston were like 80 points up after about 20 minutes, and so it was sucks a little bit, but, you know, it's cool for Boston. Um, what am I doing with that? Well, I'm actually, at the same time, I'm on Twitter following the hashtag of the game to see what people are saying about it. And then I'm skipping over to... TikTok for 20 minutes. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of watching the game. I don't know what's going on, but I'm also watching whatever shit is going on in my For You page. <coughs> and then I'm back on Twitter again. I'm making comments about the, you know, whatever. I'm not focused. I'm not watching in that sense. So that's where I question where does the word watch come in anymore? Um, there's a more fundamental thing to this, and I, I know I've asked in seminars um, in the last couple of, you know, couple of weeks ago, and I was up, you know, I've got people to say how much TikTok they were watching. Um, I forget who I asked now, but somebody said they'd watched about 20 odd hours of TikTok in a week. I told them to tell me about one video they've seen. And I was like, no, couldn't remember a thing. But that's also what I mean by watching. Like, if we watched a film, there's a reasonable expectation that like a week later you might remember some elements of it, you know, like perhaps who was in it, or what was the general theme of the film, you know, maybe, but like nobody could even articulate like what kind of videos they've watched on TikTok for that amount of time. So it's not even watching. Now, I call this a hyperactive audience. The active audience theory assumes that we're actively involved in deconstructing the text that is put in front of us, right? I think we're not. Instead, we're hyperactive, which means, you know, you've seen kids who've got hyperactivity, right? They're all over the fucking place. And they're always in the fucking supermarket at the same time as me. I'm not kidding, I nearly killed this fucking kid the other day in Tesla. Little piece of it. Uh, hyperactive little kid, probably having the time of his life, getting in my way. You know, stopping me from getting shit that I wanted off the shelves, you know. That kid's going to the hard way, next time I see him in front of the door. Um, that kid was hyperactive. And we are like that as media consumers now. We're not actually settled in the same way that we used to be. This all links to the venerable person who was in here earlier, no less ten minutes before I walked in, William Merrin and his concept of media from 2014. So, what does Will mean about what media means? Mass audiences have given way to what he calls, now I think it's a mistake on his part actually to call these diffuse audiences. I think we need to get rid of that word altogether. But Will says, instead of having a mass concentration of people looking at the same thing all the time, instead now through the presence, and Will was talking about this in 2014, so we can say it's through the presence of YouTube. Indeed, at the beginning of his book, Media Studies 2.0, he references his own son's viewing habits on YouTube. It's maybe about 23, 24 now, I guess. But back in, like, when Will was writing that book in 2013, Henry was both watching loads of YouTube, but also making YouTube content, but also couldn't sit 
for more than five minutes to watch a video on YouTube because he was straight off it onto something else all the time. And Will was sitting there and basically writing the first chapter of the book about how his son was all over the shop, right? He calls it a diffuse audience. And the technology we use plays a critical role in that transformation. Now, what I would say is, in the interim period, we've gone much further than what Will called it as a diffuse audience. We're not an audience at all anymore. We're a bunch of individuals consuming media. And that's it. Those medias were fined in that time to provide us with directly pertinent, curtailed, and curated media experiences for us as individuals. So even the person you're sitting next to right now, your friend, your peer, somebody with a rough, roughly speaking a similar sort of cultural background to you, will have a completely different experience of exactly the same application <coughs> that the two of you use on the basis of the fine, fine granularity of information that those applications have pulled down over the years. Now, Will calls that transformation from media to, he puts a dash there, media, i.e. the media is now all about me, not about something broader than that. Now, should we stop there? Let's have five minutes. It's been such good stuff, I just need to wait. Fire today, man. It's not entirely related.